live on YouTube. All right, here we go. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our February presentation of the 2021-22 Door County Maritime Speaker Series. Thank you to our sponsor, the Door County Medical Center. For those of you who are watching online, we ask that you keep your video off to assist with our bandwidth um, and your microphones muted so we don't get any um, side chatter. Um, for those of you, for all of you, please hold your questions to the end or put them in the chat of the, um, hold on a second, sorry. Uh, sorry. Um, put them in the chat on the screen and then we'll answer them at the end. So without further ado, we're gathered this evening, February 3rd, to talk about notable women and indig indigenous people around the Great Lakes with Dr. Victoria Brem. Hello. Um what I would like to do is begin with a story about the woman who created the Great Lakes. Um, I bet you didn't ever think about that. Um, her name was Atiensik, and she was an inhabitant of Sky World. The world underneath was a vast sheet of water, no land anywhere in sight. A pair of large white birds with long crooked necks, swans we are told, was swimming about on the waters. They heard a peal of thunder, the first ever heard in this world. They glanced upwards. They saw the tree and the woman as they fell from the sky. One of them explained, what a strange creature is that coming down from above? And he added, I know that she cannot be borne up by the waters. Let us swim close together and hold her upon our backs. They swam close together and the women, woman fell lightly upon their backs and rested. While swimming along, the swans bent their long necks and looked at their burden. They said to each other, what a beautiful creature it is, but what shall we do with it? We cannot always swim like this and hold her up. What shall we do? The others replied, the only way is to go and see the big turtle. He will call a council of the animals to decide as to what shall be done. They swam until they had found a big turtle. They showed him the strange creature, told him all they knew about her, and asked whether he intended to call a council of all the animals to decide her fate. A moccasin, a runner, sent by the big turtle, went around and called all the animals to a council. They came at once and for a long time remained looking at her in great wonder. The big turtle then warned them of what they had to do for they had to decide upon what was to happen. They should not even think of dropping her into the waters and leaving her to die. Since she had been sent to them in that way, it must be for their own good. And indeed, they had to find a place for her to rest upon. Now they were all greatly concerned with the matter a tree had fallen from above, they had been told by the swans. Someone suggested that if the swans could show the place wherein the tree had disappeared, the divers might go down and perhaps get just a little bit of earth clinging to its roots. The big turtle added, added in support of this idea that if the swans could show the place where the tree had fallen, a little bit of dirt clinging to its roots might be gotten and an island be made for the woman to live upon. He offered moreover to hold the island upon his back. The swans then turned around and with the women resting on their backs, they swam ahead of all the animals until they reached the spot where the tree had disappeared. Then they stood still. <clears throat> 
The turtle then summoned the best of the divers, the otter, to go deep down into the waters in search of some dirt clinging to the roots of the tree. The otter at once went down out of sight. The animals were beginning to think that he would never come back when, after a while, they saw him coming back through the clear waters. So exhausted was he that reaching the surface, he opened his mouth, gasped, and fell down again, dead, and went down. The muskrat was summoned next. He dived down and remained still longer out of sight. He failed in the same way. The beaver was then called, being the next among the best divers. He met with the same fate as the otter and the muskrat. A number of other divers were in turn sent down until so many had lost their lives to no avail that the big turtle declined to summon any other, but welcomed anyone who would volunteer and dive in quest of the tree. There was no one to offer himself for a long time. Now then, an old toad, grandmother, lost in the crow, crowd, spoke up and said that she would try. The animals all looked at each other and with much laughter jeered at the small and ugly old toad. So futile was she vainly in attempting to do what so many well-known divers had failed to accomplish. The big turtle on his part agreed that she did well to try and that perhaps she would be more lucky than the others. Then the toad took a deep breath and down she went. The animals gathered close together and kept gazing at her until she had dropped out of sight. They watched and waited for so long that they began to say to each other that it was done with her, that she would never come back. They kept waiting ever so long for they had not yet given up all hope. They could not see a thing, however. Then a bubble of air came up through the waters and by and by burst at the surface. Yet they could not see her coming. The big turtle thought that she was likely soon to appear and said, let us swim right to the place where the bubble has burst. And if Toad comes back, we shall hold her up for fear that she may fall back. So it was done. Just then, some of them could see her rising from the deep. Some others said she must have some earth, for she has been away so much longer than the others. Very soon, she glided upon the waters to one side of the big turtle, opened her mouth, and spat out just a few grains of earth that fell on the edge of the big turtle's shell. And she gasped before falling back without life. The toad is held in reverence by the Wyandots and none of them will harm her to this day. The little turtle at once began rubbing and spreading the dirt around the edge of big turtle shell. It began to grow into an island the animals were looking on as it grew. The island soon became large enough for the woman to live upon. The two white birds swam to its edge and the woman stepped off onto it. The island grew larger and larger until it had become our island, Turtle Island, the world as we know it. I started with that uh, story from the Huron, the Wyandotte, because I wanted to reorient your sense of Great Lakes history. Europeans and Christianity, Judaism, have been in the Great Lakes for 400 years. I would guess that Antiensek was there for several thousand. I think it's also very interesting that a nation in its foundation story chooses a woman 
and she is rescued by a woman. This is very different from, say, Adam's rib, which is what women become in the biblical creation story. I started researching the roles of women on the Great Lakes um, really by chance. I began my career as a scholar of maritime literature, and I created pretty much the field of maritime literature on the Great Lakes. I never thought I would do anything with women. Uh, I mean, my idea of maritime was to go out on the water with a bunch of guys, and I loved it. I loved sailing and I loved being on ore carriers and um, I, I couldn't even really be bothered with anything else. But as I began to do research to collect the materials I needed to do a bibliography, to do a dissertation, um, I started discovering narratives by women. And I initially thought, well, this is a one-off. I'm not going to pay any attention to it. So I would copy it as kind of a curiosity and throw it in a file. And I did research for two or three years around the lakes in, in libraries, in, uh, uh, you know, uh, small historical societies, anywhere I could go where I thought I might find a narrative or uh, an old book of fiction. And whenever I would find something by women, I would add it to the file. Well, eventually it outgrew the file and it moved into a banker's box, you know, one of those square things that you keep records in. And I kept periodically adding to it and wrote a dissertation and then wrote another book and kept going on. And and finally, one summer, I came home and I dumped out the contents of two banker's boxes on my office floor and started shuffling things into piles by subject. You know, what we had, I had women travelers, how many of those? Uh, I had women cooks on the Great Lakes. And by the time I got done, I thought, well, I guess I've got a book. So I sat down and started looking at, at what it meant to be a woman encountering, a white woman encountering the lakes for the first time, as opposed to a native woman who had grown up here and who was probably involved in, in the fur trade. And out of those researches came the Women's Great Lakes Reader. Um, I was never hopeful that it would amount to anything. I was always very surprised when people liked it. Uh, I was happy, but I was surprised. And it was finally named one of 50 essential books for Michigan history, which I, I found truly surprising. But I did try to um, I, I did try to show the range of women's experiences on the lakes as I knew it at the time when I did that book, which was in the late 1990s. Um, I, had a, I have a section on, on uh, women and a schnabeg, which I now look at and think, well, yeah, so what happened to the Dakota? What happened to the people I, I didn't put in? I put in a section of women pioneers on the frontier for the simple reason that I had always been told from feminist theory and, and feminist discussions that women on the frontier suffered. Oh my God, how terrible. They had to leave their pianos. They had to do all this to come to the frontier. Well, what I discovered is that women encountering the frontier of the Great Lakes suddenly were free in ways they had never been free in New England. Because on a frontier, there are never enough hands to do the work. And so women could do all kinds of things that they would have been prevented from doing 
had they stayed in the East or Europe. I also never, I found one whining, complaining response. Um, I also expected that I would find, you know, the great romantic scene of, of the woman in childbirth on a storm, in a, uh, in a ship on a storm, uh, you know, terrible, dramatic, uh, the woman dies, the baby lives, and on and on. Never found it. These women didn't talk about having children. They all had children. It was normal. Everybody did. That was not what they were interested in. What they were interested in is what they were seeing, the kind of experiences they had, what was opening up to them. I did a section on women travelers because one of the interesting things about the Great Lakes is that because it was opened up so soon to extractive industry like the copper mines uh, or the iron ore mines, and because there was easy transportation on ships, women could penetrate into a really unspoiled frontier the way they couldn't, they could do it fairly easily and fairly safely the way they normally couldn't unless they had a lot of money. Now, Anna Jameson, to get away from her alcoholic husband, uh, took a trip. She was the first white woman to take a trip with just her guides and go all over um, Lake Huron and all the way up to Mackinac, all the way up to Sault Ste. Marie. But most women couldn't afford that. And they also didn't want to spend a couple of months in a canoe. But with steam travel, even without steam travel, they could travel. In addition, travel literature was one of the things that women could write about when they were forbidden from writing about anything else. They couldn't write about politics. It was not considered polite or even possible for women to be smart enough to write about politics. So they could go to the Great Lakes and they could write about politics there as travel literature. Furthermore, travel literature paid well. And at a period when women had to earn a living and so many of the professions were completely closed to them, becoming a writer, if you happen to be lucky enough to be educated, to, educated enough to do it, was um, a, generally a good thing. Travel literature allowed you to get out of the house. It allowed you to give your opinion on things that you would normally not allow women um, to, to write about. I'm, I'm talking here about um, the late 19th century. Well, actually most of the 19th century for travel literature for the Great Lakes, but it continues. It, it goes right up into almost the present. Um, the last thing I did, for travel literature was um, 1962. And so that was a little bit before the book. I also did a section on women's work um, because even though the ideal in the Victorian period was that women stayed at home and they raised their children um, to be good adults, and they supported their husbands and therefore his career, you know, the typical 1950s thing. The problem with that is that women have always had to work. And in the 19th century, there developed a split between ladies who could stay home and women who had to go out into the world and work. And I wanted to look at some of these women. I started out with Madame La Framboise, the fur trader. And I, I'm gonna interrupt myself a little bit here and say, I'm, I'm now writing a second volume of the Women's Reader. And I have an entire section on women fur traders. Um, this was surprising to me. I did not expect to find that many. And I will circle back and talk about this in a minute. I also put in a section on women cooks. At certain times in the 19th century, women were a status symbol on sailing ships. 
particularly young girls from the farm. At other times, if times were hard, such as in the 1870s when there was a major depression, went on for what, six, eight years, um, women would be driven off. I wanted to do a section on women light keepers. And in fact, I began the book with a woman light keeper. And what I discovered when I looked at women light keepers, I went back in and counted the government documents. There were a number of them just before and after the Civil War. Um, <clears throat> it was a good job, but it paid better if to go into a factory to do a lot of other things. After the Civil War, when the recession started, I noticed that women began to lose their jobs. <clears throat> Excuse me, I have a cold, I'm sorry, I sound like a frog. Women began to lose their jobs as light keepers. And I could go through and count the numbers that were replaced every year. So I started asking the boys, um, the guys I'd always hung around with in the Association for Great Lakes Maritime History. And, and what they said was, oh, well, you know, that's when all that steam fog equipment came in and, and women couldn't shovel the coal and, and they couldn't handle all that. And I didn't say anything, but what I thought was bunk. I can shovel coal, they can shovel coal. So I went one summer to um, the National Archives in Washington to look at the correspondence about these women light keepers. Now, if you've never been in the National Archives, it is, is a very beautiful, gorgeous building. And the reading room is, is very serene and very quiet. There are lots of ladies there in plaid skirts and matching sweaters doing genealogical research from Virginia. And I went through truck after truck of letters. And as I documented in the Women's Reader, oh yes, there were the letters that um, please replace this woman with a suitable man. And I just stood up in the middle of the National Archives and went, yes, I knew it. And sure enough, the only women who retained their lights to the end of the century were women who had political connections. Everybody else lost them. I then finished that book with a section I called Women's Lives, Women's, uh, Women's Lakes, just about every woman, ordinary women's lives on the lakes and what they wrote about it. Now, I never expected to write another women's reader. Um, first of all, I thought I had cherry picked all the good stuff the first time around. I mean, well, logically, wouldn't you? Um, secondly, I did Star Songs and Water Spirits, which was a, a collection of native literatures from the three major language families around the Great Lakes and that put in all the documents that I thought would be interesting. I, I was a professor and I taught teachers and I knew they were required to teach native literature. And when I saw some of the things they did uh, and were led to do, I was appalled. So I spent 10 years teaching myself about native literatures and putting together star songs and water spirits. It's now used as a textbook in the native language programs at University of Michigan, University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, and a couple of other places. In the process of doing that book, I ran into this little partial autobiography strange little thing in, in an archive, obviously written by a woman, obviously not complete, um, but it was about a Métis, that is a mixed race woman uh, from up on Lake Superior from Ashland. And it seemed to be a partial autobiography. So when I was next in the Twin Cities, I, I went to the Historical Society and took them what I had, 
And in, in one of those, you know, little things of grace is all I can explain. Um, the reference librarian on duty, when I ask him, you know, where's the rest of this? He thought for a minute and he said, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Give me a little while. And pretty soon he came back and said, well, it's in the architectural archives. And so I had to drive clear across, you know, Minneapolis um, and to get this entire autobiography, which it ended up just by chance um, in the architectural archives. And that became a little history of my forest life. The story of Eliza Morrison um, and what it was like to go from uh, living as a, a homesteader and then finally into the reservation um, at, um, at Ashland, outside Ashland, at Bad River. So I was kind of busy. Um, and then, of course, I, I stopped and I also did um, White Squall uh, because the people I had sailed with said, well, you promised us a, a book and so now we want it. So, so I did it. And I finally got around to thinking, you know, I wonder if there's anything else I can do for toward a woman's reader because I really fluffed some things the first time around. Uh, I only talked about uh, Schnabig women. Uh, I didn't understand a lot of what I had learned in the process of doing other books. So I started doing research just to see what I could find. Yeah, it's just playing around. And what I have discovered are some fairly interesting things, even to me. Um, a lot of women fur traders, many women fur traders. You know, we are trained to, and we have been trained to think of the fur trade as this beautiful canoe going down the rapids filled with voyageurs, you know, with their colorful, their hats, you know, with the crow feather in the, in the top and, and all the rest. Yeah, well, the cargo that those voyagers carried at least 50% of the time was owned by women in Montreal or Quebec. Because remember, the fur trade was the economic engine that drove North America for at least two centuries. It, it would be the equivalent to, say, um, the computer industry today. So if you wanted to make money, you got into the fur trade one way or another. And the women of New France had a whole lot more freedom and a lot more legal protections than they would have after the British and the Americans took over. They could enter contracts with their own name. Um, they kept their dowries. Uh, if their husband died, uh, they got half the estate. Uh, they had all kinds of legal protection. And the women who lived in, in New York before the Dutch took over had those protections too. Um, once the British took over, that all ended. And so we don't see that many women fur traders after 1760. Before then, they were all over. And they, they were actually quite common. There were women who went with their trade goods into the upper country. Um, the wife of Antoine de la Motte Cadillac, who founded Detroit, was a fur trader in her own right. That's how she made money. He wasn't making very much. And so six months pregnant, she is in a canoe on Lake Erie with a load of trade goods headed for Detroit. And she did that more than once. Many of the women who were fur traders were Matisse. They were part French, part native. They had been born into the fur trade and they simply continued with it. Um, the fur trade, of course, comes to a crashing halt about 1840. And 
then I, I followed one woman um, who eventually turns to farming. The other group of women I'm, I'm looking at are maritime women. I didn't want to look at cooks again because I'd done cooks in the first woman reader, woman's reader. So I started trying to research if there had been any captains. And of course, sure enough, once you start looking, you find them. I not only found woman captains, I found woman cross-dressers because after the Civil War, if you needed to earn a living as a woman and you were not educated, you didn't have too many choices. You could move to a city and go into a factory, which didn't pay very well. You could go out in service, that was called. You could be somebody's maid where you were on call 24 seven for months and months and months at a time. You'd be lucky to get a day off. Um, you could take in laundry, which didn't pay very well. You could take in sewing, which allowed you to slowly starve to death. You might get a job teaching if you were educated, but school was not free then, it was expensive. And so if you grew up lower class, you probably weren't educated. I wonder when it was that the first woman who happened to be down on the docks, and she may have been a prostitute for all we know, figured out how much men were earning to sail. And remember, during those years, the Great Lakes was a maritime country. The railroads were primitive if they were there at all. The roads were dreadful. They were mud holes in spring and fall. If you went anywhere, you went by boat. Most families had a boat. It's, it's how you got around if you lived anywhere near the coast. And so women grew up sailing. If sailing was a family occupation, of course they learned to sail. They lived on the boat. And so there were women that had good sailing skills, but of course the industry didn't want them sailing. One of my very favorite legal cases is of the cook on a sailing ship who wanted to sail because she knew more than the mate and furthermore, she was sober and the captain didn't want to let her. So according to the news report, she took a cast iron pot off the stove and cracked him over the head. They went to court, she won. I don't think she got to sail. So if you wanted to sail as a woman and you wanted to earn good money, you could cut off your hair. If you were skinny, you could dress like a man. Now remember, there were no health exams then. You signed on for one voyage only, which might be two, three days or a week. And then you could sign on to another ship. So it was actually quite simple to cross-dress and masquerade as a man. I also found a number of women captains um, starting in the 1960s, in the 1860s, excuse me. Um, they sailed their own ships and bargained for cargoes. They did everything a man could do. We are told that there were no women captains um, until the 1980s, and that's just not true. I am getting toward the end of what I need to say. Uh, I will say the new women's reader is probably going to be out um, either in late fall or early January, February, about a year from now. Um, I also talk about native slavery um, and two of my favorite part native women who were the daughters of John Askin, the great Detroit merchant. And I talk about how that made, um, was part of a very accepting, multicultural, multilingual world on the Great Lakes for generations. After the Civil War, when the Americans take over and the economy goes south, um, that all begins to disappear until by the 20th century, it, it's completely gone. 
the natives are, have had to choose. Um, Métis people have had to choose. They're either going to go to a reservation or they're going to blend into white culture. And uh, women have become truly mostly confined in the home, except for the brief new woman's movement around the turn of the, the, uh, uh, the 20th century. Oh, let's see. Um, that book will, as I said, will be out in a year. And I've, as I said, said about all I need to say right now, I would like to answer your questions if you have any. Everybody, if you would, um, I'm going to see if I can ask you all. Oh, here we go. Allow participants to unmute. So, if you have questions, um, please uh, unmute yourself. Uh, you can open your video up and um, speak up and uh, be polite, you know, and and. Uh, yield the floor, but go ahead. Kathy Hamilton, I think you had a couple questions um, kind of as, as Victoria was going along. If you want to chime in, um, maybe in, and broaden your questions a little bit. Oh, great. Thank you so much. Um, Victoria, I really enjoyed hearing you speak. And this is uh, w one of my passions. Uh, my family grew up in, uh, I was raised up in uh, northern Wisconsin. So it's kind of like hits home for me. Um, but my question is about the women fur traders that you spoke of. Uh, were they were they trappers or did they procure goods mainly and then go trade them? The name's oh, they, no, the trapping the was top. primarily done, I think, Perfect. by men. Um, okay. Although women certainly no. would have gone out and helped. Women tended to process furs. One of the things that the industrials, the industrialized fur trade did was it put native slavery on steroids. Speaker's name. And it also no. um, turned women into doing peace dream. work for the fur trade. But the women that I was looking at, particularly the French women from Montreal and Quebec, um, they procured goods. Um, and they would sometimes hire a man to go out with it. Sometimes, very rarely, they could become the factor of a fur, a fur trade post. Um, the one at La Pointe, actually, for a while was, quote unquote, owned by a woman. In other words, she got all the proceeds from it. Uh, and of course, what you did was smuggle your furs into New England because you got better prices than you got from the French and the goods were better. So you gave a portion of your furs to the French to satisfy the authorities. And then you smuggled down uh, one of the rivers as much as you could into New England. In fact, there were three sisters who lived right outside Montreal who smuggled furs, they smuggled everything into New England. And the French authorities tried to stop them for, I don't know, 20, 30 years, totally failed. Um, they finally retired. Women would go with their furs and those were primarily part native women, Matisse, because they were just going home. You know, they lived there. It wasn't the wilderness to them. And they would go with trade, they would go with trade goods and they would bargain for furs. Um, Madame La Framboise would go down by Muskegon, Michigan every winter with her, her slaves rode, her, uh, rode her, her barges and she would go down and bargain for furs all winter. But she spoke fluent, probably Odawa and uh, also French and also English. Everybody then was multilingual. And then she would go back to Mackinac Island in the spring 
and turn in her furs. And she outlasted the American Fur Company. She outlasted John Jacob Astor. I mean, she finally had to buy her supplies from him, but she retired when she wanted to. The, the fur company, in fact, still owed her money when she retired. Okay, did I answer your question, Kathy? Okay. Judy Reynolds, do you have a question? I, I can't hear you. Oh, your your audio is off. No, I didn't have a question. Okay. Someone else? <clears throat> Can't hear you, Kathy. No one can unmute. Where's our moderator? They all they can unmute themselves. They've all, they've all been allowed. Okay, it's working now. But it was coming up saying no one can unmute. Um, the, the, I'll go ahead and ask a question if nobody else is lined up. But uh, women captains, I, I think that's pretty amazing. And so um, do you have any like, little quips of a story about uh, about your favorite woman captain well um, women i mean if you had to get from point a to point b and you had a boat and your husband was sick or dead you sailed now in order to carry the mail or carry passengers um you had to have a license uh but the licensing exams were not that difficult. I think my favorite is a woman from South Manitou. She was also a midwife. Uh, her husband was a farmer, but not particularly successful one. He eventually fell off the dock and drowned. So she had a not very big boat. I'm gonna say maybe 30 feet, if that. And she used to carry the mail between South Manitou and the mainland. And also she would take passengers and she'd take them over to Wisconsin if they wanted to go. Well, she got a man for a passenger one time and the weather kicked up really badly. And she was absolutely fearless. She had grown up sailing with her father on, on, her, father's, um, uh, on her father's two or three masted schooner. So she'd seen weather from the time she was a child. Nothing bothered her. The man kept offering her money to turn around and go back and turn around and go back. And the more she refused, the more money he offered her. And finally, she said, listen, the fare is $5. I promise to land you in Wisconsin. I'm going to land you in Wisconsin. Shut up and sit down. <laughs> and she did. Um, she was great. Uh, there's also another wonderful story about her that when she quit sailing, she got a job as a cook on one of the car ferries running between Michigan and Wisconsin. And at one point, now this is this is acryful story from her family. At one point, Henry Ford was there and she was making pies. He was a passenger on the boat. And he came into the galley and he wanted a piece of pie. And she said, well, you have to wait until lunch. And he said, well, I, I really want a piece of pie. She said, Mr. Ford, you have to wait until lunch. Everybody has to wait until lunch. Mm -hmm. So I, I think they were pretty, you know, pretty tough women. Um, 
and they were fearless, really. Um, the youngest one I've come across was 12. She sailed on her father's ship and her father taught her how to sail. But it, it makes a lot of sense because a lot of people had a little single proprietorship in the 19th century and, and even earlier, the 18th century. Um, and they could, you know, carry a cargo from here. It would be like today owning your own truck. You went from place to place and you, you carted goods, except with the ship, you could live on it. And if economic times were terrible and you lost your house on shore or you never had one, you could live on the ship all the way. And a lot of people did. Okay. Questions from anyone else? Uh, Victoria, we've got a question. Um, did Barbara Schumann continue to sail after her husband's schooner, the Rousey Simmons, was lost in a storm? I didn't understand what you said. It's really... Did Barbara Schooneman, the, the wife of the captain of the Christmas tree ship? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Did she, she continue sailed... to sail after she... the ship was lost? She and her daughter sailed for a while because they had to. Um, they, had, they were terribly in debt. Uh, the cargo was not insured. Um, the sailors that went down with the ship uh, had families. And so I don't know whether Barbara got her license. I know her daughter did. And sometimes they would sail. Sometimes they would hire people to sail for them. Um, and they did this for a number of years uh, until Barbara, I think, died and her daughter married and then she, she stopped sailing. But they had to do it. Partly it was advertising. Partly it was the only way they had to earn a living. No we've, got, we've got another question of all your books. Do you have a favorite? Why is it of your favorite? I think my favorite is always the one I'm working on at the time. Um, at the moment, it's the new Women's Great Lakes Reader because it's, it's interesting. Um, Star Songs and Water Spirits, I, you know, I, no, I don't have a favorite. I've really enjoyed writing them. I have learned so much. And I, I think the one plea I would like to make uh, is for other people to do more with women's history on the Great Lakes. All I have done is barely scratch the surface, just tiny. You could get easily a good dissertation out of women fur traders. If you were willing to go into South Chicago to the national records, you could search for more women captains. Um, with the resources we have now with Google and with all the newspapers online, it's actually gotten much easier than it was when I started. So it's possible. Um, I think it's tremendously important because otherwise the focus becomes just shipwreck because that's what gets published. Um, publishers know maritime museums like shipwreck because it brings people in and it, 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 shipwreck is fascinating for the same reason that, you know, we slow down and look at a traffic crash. It, it gives people what the French call a frisson, um, F-R-I-S-S-O-N. It's like, you know, oh, there but for the grace of God go I. It allows us to be scared and be safe. And it's very addictive. It's very technological. Um, but it's such a tiny slice of Great Lakes history. And the rest of it tends to go begging, which is way too sad, I think, um, particularly for women's studies. I would just say the field is wide open. Mm 
you probably should learn to speak French. And it would help if you could speak Quebecois, because a lot of those records are going to be in 18th century French. But it is it is there. Okay. Jill Anderson, did you have a question? Can't hear you. Jill, you're muted. Okay, I think, I'm want... I think I'm unmuted now. Yes. Oh, great. Okay. What um, was your question? Well, I can't wait to read some of your books. This has been a wonderful conversation. Thank you. When you are researching these Native American um, chronicles, information about the women that you were talking about a little earlier, what kind of format do you find those in? Are they oral histories? Are they something that someone wrote down kind of after the fact? What, how, do you, how do you track that down? How do you find those things? Or in what form do you find them? Oh, Lord. Everything. Um, the women fur traders that I tracked down tended to turn up in legal cases in the French courts in Montreal. Sometimes a historian has written a scholarly article about them. And you can find it doing research in the scholarly databases. You have to sift through a lot. I, I will be very honest about that. Sometimes they turn up in um, the newspapers in Quebec. Again, it's going to be in French. Um, there is a website in Michigan called Michigan's Habitat Heritage that has a partial listing of them. And it's a very good resource for research. Um, but, you know, if you need an excuse to spend some time in Montreal, this would give it to you. Um, I, I wish I could be more specific, but you find them everywhere. And you just have to follow the breadcrumb trail um, through ancestry, through newspapers, through legal cases. Um, I communicate a lot with research librarians at the Quebec Archives and at the Robarts Library in Toronto. Um, I work really closely with the Clark Historical Library at Central Michigan University in, in Michigan um, without, without research librarians, I'd be lost because they're much better at it than I am. Rich, you're muted, can't hear you. Still can't hear you. Okay, uh, the host isn't letting us unmute, but uh, we are. I'm. I'll, I'll, let me get video going here. Okay. Um, just, just a second here. Uh, all right, uh, Mike. Uh, uh, many of the lighthouse keepers uh, had families, and uh, I am wondering if you have any of your um, any uh, favorite uh, lighthouse keeper stories about women who uh, uh, filled in at times when uh, when the man wasn't wasn't able to, and uh, that type of thing. Well. First of all, after the Civil War, many of the men who had lighthouses were given the, the, the job because they had been disabled in the war. And it was assumed their families would do the work. And that meant the women. Um, I have in this next book, a whole section on children who grew up in lighthouses and the stories they wrote about it later, some of which are absolutely hysterical because of course they got into incredible trouble. Uh, the lighthouse at Marblehead, Ohio, uh, 
was basically run by a woman and her daughters. They did everything. Uh, you read the logs and they talk about, well, you know, we canned 15 quarts of strawberries today. And this is the whole time that they're also running the lighthouse. Uh, so they worked incredibly hard. And I think you get more of a sense of what women would do um, in this next book where the children are writing the narratives because they talk about what, what women did. Um, some children were never allowed in the tower at all for probably pretty good reasons. Um, I don't really have a favorite story about women lighthouse keepers. Well, yes, I do too. Um, it's in the women's reader as the fall of the lighthouse. And it is the story by Frances Hurlbut. Now she was the sister of a really famous Great Lakes captain. And they had built this lighthouse um, near Mackinac Island too close to the shore. And her brother kept saying, this lighthouse is gonna fall. And sure enough, one time it did. And she realized it was falling. She could see the crack going up the wall of the lighthouse. So in the midst of this storm, she gets her, her little adopted child to help her. And they saved the lamps and the lenses. And these were like coal oil lamps um, or whale oil lamps and carry them down the stairs, not knowing if the lighthouse was gonna collapse while they were doing this, um, to save them so that the lighthouse could be rebuilt. Um, I, I used to give a paper um, for many years when there were only two women in the Association for Great Lakes Maritime History, myself and a, and a woman who was a diver. And periodically I would, I would give a paper on women lighthouse keepers and I would say to the men, okay, I'd like you to imagine now what it's like to walk up the cert, you know, spiral stairs of a lighthouse in number one, a corset that restricts your breath. Number two, long skirts. Now you pinned your skirts up, you, you pinned up the overskirt and perhaps you pinned up your petticoats but you still had skirts. Now you're carrying two pails of boiling lard oil and you've got to get up to the tower room with that in all these clothes. And we're not even gonna talk about menstrual cramps doing this uh, and get it into the light room so that you could do the light. I, I opened the women's reader um, with the story uh, of the woman lightkeeper outside Chicago uh, who um, they tried to get rid of her. Her name was Harriet Colfax. She never married. They tried for years and years to get rid of her. And one of the ways they tried is she had to light the pier head lights that stuck out into the lake. Well, when she wouldn't leave, they moved the pier headlight from the pier she could walk down, even though the waves would go over her head, and they moved it to the other pier. So she had to get into a boat and row to the other pier to be able to light the light. Now, remember now we got the boiling lard oil here too, because if it's really cold, she'd have to go back into the house and reheat it and go back. It was a very, very tough life. Did I answer your question, Rich? Okay. Um, I put Harriet Colfax's logs in the Women's Great Lakes Reader. And they're interesting for the time she went to the government and said, you know, this is not working. And the government, of course, just kind of ignored her. We are running out of time. Uh, we have run out. Um, the the uh, bookstore is turning into a pumpkin. It's 9.02.
and the lady who was here working would really like to go home. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. I really appreciate your interest. Um, Paige knows how to get a hold of me if you have questions that did not get answered and she can certainly put you in touch and I'm happy to try and answer your questions. All right. Thank you, Thank you so Victoria, much. Victoria for jumping through techno hoops tonight to be with us for Michigan. So, and thank you everybody. We'll see you all March 3rd here in the museum. Um, provided Tamara Thompson, uh, who works for uh, UW can join us as long as COVID is cooperating. But uh, with that, good evening everybody. Thank you all. Bye.